Welcome to your PwC Connections, a monthly look at what's happening inside PwC and out in our community. I'm your host, Courtney Lucas. We've got a great show for you today. First, three glimpses inside PwC. Hear from former PwC interns, now full-time employees, about their careers in engineering, just in time for National Engineers Week. We'll learn about National Procurement Month, the upcoming annual water changeover, and answer your questions about the recent cold snap and boil water advisory. Plus, have you ever wondered about those green boxes in your front yard? We'll tell you all about them. And share the details about a few upcoming community events, so stay with us. I was an intern uh, summer of 2016 and then I was hired uh, late June 2017 after I graduated from college. Uh, intern wise it was mostly getting the work that engineers already did and going out and just mapping it to make sure it matches GIS so if they put a new pole in I'd basically go out and say okay the new pole is located here it's a 2016 pole it's this tall that way the GIS map matches up to the work they did. I'm doing a lot of preventative maintenance, so I'm going out and seeing these poles are old, so I'm changing them out, seeing if there's any damages in any voids breaking, they're chipping any uh, termites getting to them, replacing them, and I'm getting more into doing underground work, reconducting neighborhoods, and running services to houses and new neighborhoods, installing new transformers, things like that, mostly using GIS. Uh, the biggest thing I got is everyone, when they first saw me, like, I recognize you, but you don't really know from where. And it was kind of like, oh, as an intern, I was like, oh, yeah, I do remember you. And then going from, okay, kind of following what everybody wanted me to do, just kind of working for everybody as the college kid, just, all right, I need you to do this, need you to do this, need you to do this, to kind of being on the same playing field a lot of them, to saying, instead of just working for them, I'm working with them on jobs. So I wasn't going out and finding the jobs they already did, but actually helping them do those jobs. The biggest thing with engineering that really called me is I like designing things, I like building things, I like taking things from my mind and bringing it physically. So I picked engineering because you get to see the step by step. You have a problem, you think of an idea for a problem, you troubleshoot, you brainstorm, you figure out what the best way to fix that problem is, then you do your testing and you say, this works the best doing it this way, this works best doing it this way, until you get a final physical thing that you have that you test it out and say, okay, this was the problem and this is what I designed and built to fix this problem. And that's what really I enjoyed is that I can go from a design that's completely in my mind and finally making something and putting it out in the real world. Uh, the biggest thing I know through high school, everyone says engineering is a lot of math, it's a lot of work, you're going to go in and be ready to work. You're going to have a lot of other people that are coming in with you as freshmen also going into college that have the same kind of fear that it's going to be hard work, it's going to be a lot of math, and you're really not going to be prepared for it. But when you get into it and you start working with it, you see it all kind of builds on itself. So it's not all this math at once. It's a little bit here, a little bit there. And don't let the engineering field really scare you. You're, you're, the, the dream that you have of you being able to design and build things, it is going to be there. Yes, you have to go through all the math and all the steps to get there. But if you keep following that dream and keep working to it, you'll get to see that big payoff at the end of it all. Uh, my first internship was in 2010, and I was under Mark Tunstall in the Electric Construction Department. I was assigned a task of going through a lot of outage records and creating a database on what caused the outage, whether it was an animal or a car accident were the main two reasons. I became a full-time employee after my second internship in 2011. The gentleman who was in the current SCADA specialist position had left a few weeks previous for a different job and they were looking for somebody to fill in that position. And seeing that I'd already interned for two summers, I was somewhat familiar with it. Uh, they offered me a full-time position, which I gladly accepted. But probably the biggest change is as an intern, no one expects you to know anything. And the next day, everyone expected me to be an expert on the subject. And that, that was the, the biggest change, is going from nothing but grace until all of a sudden, nope, nope, now it's yours. Now you take ownership of this position. Go with it. Um, I decided to go into the engineering field, honestly, for pragmatic reasons. I had a liberal arts degree, and my wife at the wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. 
and I had the GI Bill and I said, well, if I decide I wanted to make a change in my career path, this is the time to do it. So I went back to school and got my degree in computer networking and I was honestly looking for what could, again, pragmatically get me the most money with the least amount of time in school. And that's the science, technology, engineering, math field. So I got a two-year degree in computer networking, which makes more money than a four-year history degree does. The engineers keep everything working the way it should be. They keep your water flowing, your toilets flushing, they keep your lights on, they keep your video feed working during the Super Bowl. All that is not possible without engineers, from your network engineers, your electrical engineers, your civil engineers, they're all needed to make the world function as it should. What I would say to kids when they're deciding on what they want to major in, you will always be able to find work with a STEM degree. If you're looking at going to a school and taking out tens of thousands of dollars in student loan and you're going to get a degree like I did in liberal arts, be prepared to be paying off that loan for the rest of your life. But if you get a STEM degree, you can start out making more money out the gate and you can pay off that student loan much quicker and get that burden off your shoulders faster. It's, again, a pragmatic reason is more money, faster, always being able to find work, and for the most part, you're going to be more appreciated with your job because you keep the world working. I, I do enjoy what I do. Um, I, I couldn't have the lifestyle that I have now. I couldn't have the time I could spend with my family that I do now if I were teaching. I'd be working more hours for honestly less money than the job I currently have. I work with great people, I enjoy the people I work with, and I enjoy the tasks that I'm assigned, I enjoy the problem solving behind it. So this is a great job and I do, I do really enjoy it. Do your part, be water smart, and save money with PWC's new Rain Sensor Incentive Program. It may be hard to believe, but the water used for your irrigation system can consume up to 40% of your total water usage during the hot summer months. Fayetteville PwC is offering water customers an incentive to add a rain sensor to their irrigation systems. Rain sensors are devices that can be attached to an automatic irrigation system to monitor rainfall levels. When a certain amount of rainfall is detected, the rain sensor temporarily overrides the controller to prevent unnecessary irrigation. Once the rain sensor dries out, the system operates according to the timer. The incentive is equal to the retail cost of the rain sensor up to a maximum of $50. Any current residential or commercial water and or irrigation customer is eligible to participate as long as they don't already have a rain sensor device installed. And only new qualifying models of rain sensors will be eligible for the bill credit. The program is valid from April 1st until September 30th. Customers must agree to an on-site audit by a PwC conservation specialist after the rain sensor is purchased and installed. For complete program details, water irrigation tips, and information about PwC's odd-even outdoor watering schedule, visit our website or give the Customer Programs Call Center a ring at 223-4600. Procurement is acquiring goods and services for the PwC. Um, let's say anything from water mains to uh, electric lines to um, general landscape, maintenance, custodial services. Um, so we're, we're a broad spectrum as far as uh, types of goods and services that we um, have here at PwC. National Procurement Month is a uh, kind of an attaboy for all procurement professionals um, throughout the nation. Um, here locally, uh, we want to educate our uh, rate payers of what procurement does for uh, the commission and also um, on a national stage, uh, go out and promote the value of procurement and how much overall we uh, save the taxpayers or rate payers in, in our case. Uh, uh, overall and so for example we put out around 60 large bids per year um, they range from thirty thousand dollars to up to ten fifteen million dollars so anytime we have competitive bidding on those projects um, we usually go with the lowest price 
um, if everything checks out. So overall, last year I think we saved more than uh, close to $4 million dollars um, for, for our rate payers. You find out about our bids in a couple of different ways. Uh, one's our website. We post all our active uh, bids on the website. It's a real-time posting. It gives a notice, um, tells you w when we're going to accept bids and um, the closing date for those bids. So um, it gives you that information. There's also a, a vendor application link where you can click there and apply as a vendor and you get on our mailing list. So when we have uh, procurements that are in your uh, scope of uh, services that you provide, we'll send you a solicitation for those services or products. On our website also, we post all outreach opportunities. Um, we do um, in-house instruction for vendors and even uh, rate payers if they want to come in and um, uh, look to see how our procurement process works. As well as outreach, uh, we do an outreach in the community an annually and uh, it's called our Building Business Rally. And there we, last, last time we did a, a reverse vendor type deal where the vendors came in to all our departments and, uh, and they could see firsthand of what we provide and what we need, um, what's in demand so uh, the businesses can uh, tailor themselves to us and possibly do business with us in the long run. Be on the lookout through all our communication channels for the Building Business Rally. There's a couple of different things that occur uh, during National Procurement Month. Usually on our end, uh, we do outreach and we go to uh, our, our annual conference. Um, we've been recognized uh, by our peers for the last two years. Out of the hundreds of procurement departments in North Carolina, PwC is one of 13 um, departments that achieved this type of award. So it's pretty big for um, PwC and it's um, pretty big to be recognized um, throughout the uh, um, state of North Carolina as one of the best procurement departments in the state. At Fayetteville's Public Works Commission, people make the difference. My name's Chris and I'm a lineman at PwC. Chris and his colleagues help make PwC one of the most reliable power providers in the nation. As a local public power company, PwC can provide faster emergency response. With system upgrades and continuous maintenance, they ensure the excellent everyday service. And their rates are among the lowest in the state. For tips on conserving power, visit PwC's website. PwC gets its raw water from two, two different sources. The first source being the Cape Fear River, which PwC gets about 80% of its raw water. The other water source is the Glenville Lake. The water treatment process starts with raw water coming into the plants. The water goes through some mixers and we add chemicals to it, the main chemical being ferric sulfate. Um, after the water moves through the mixers, it goes through our flocculator basins. When the, the flock is formed, we go to our next process, which is our sedimentation process. In that process, the larger particles of flock fall out into the sedimentation basins, and from that process, the water moves on to our filter process, which in that process, we remove the smaller particles of flock. Once the water moves through our filter process, it goes to our clear wells. Once the water reaches our clear wells, it is pumped out into our distribution system, which goes out to the public. From the time the raw water comes into our plants and reaches our clear wells, that could be five to six hours. And from there, within another 12 to 24 hours, it'd be pumped out to the public. The annual water changeover occurs during the month of March. When we stop adding ammonia as part of our disinfection process and switch over to a free chlorine residual. The state requires all utilities who use ammonia as part of its disinfection process to switch over to a free chlorine residual to help control any biological growth that may have occurred in the distribution system. Other utilities that uh, use chloramines and switch over to a free residual include the cities of Raleigh, Charlotte, Greensboro, Johnston County, and Harnett County, to name a few. Some of the changes that customers may experience is a slight chlorine smell to their water. When we're on chloramines, you really don't have that smell but with a free chlorine residual, you may have a slight chlorine smell, something that might resemble a swimming pool smell. When we're going through the process, we also do some hydrant flushing. 
so they may notice a little discoloration in their water. There will be several hydrants that are flushed and these hydrants are marked with a cone and a sign stating the purpose of why the hydrant is, is running or being flushed. Hydrant flushing helps us have a rapid changeover from a chloramines to a free chlorine residual. That way we can get a maximum exposure of the free chlorine to meet the state regulations. The Partnership for Safe Drinking Water is a voluntary initiative made up of the EPA, the American Water Works Association, and other water utilities across the country with a purpose of enhancing the water treatment process. They look at operational procedures, maintenance procedures, and ma even management procedures to help accomplish this. The overall goal of the partnership is to enhance drinking water quality. We have received awards from the Partnership for Safe Drinking Water. In fact, PwC was the first utility in the state of North Carolina to receive this award in the year 2000 and every year since, so a total of 15 years. The award is given out to, to utilities that not only meet the regulatory standards but exceed them. I enjoy doing my job here at PwC as a uh, water treatment operator. Uh, we do a lot of tours here at the plant and it makes you feel good when you can show people the process of the water treatment. Um, you can show them the beginning water coming from the Cape Fear River and the finished product and they're just kind of amazed at the difference in what the water looks like. So I feel very proud working at PwC and I think it's a very, very great opportunity for all the operators at PwC to, to work at the water treatment plants. We feel really great when we go to different conferences and stuff throughout the state and knowing that we are a previous winner of the best tasting water just gives us a little bit of pride. Electric cars have a major impact on local air quality as they have zero operating emissions and an overall reduction in carbon dioxide emissions. Electric cars also have lower operational costs and have lower maintenance costs because of fewer moving parts than gas-powered vehicles. If you drive an electric vehicle or are considering buying one, PwC has a great offer for you. Thanks to a grant from the North Carolina Clean Energy Technology Center, PwC has installed four Level 2 charging stations that can be used for free. Together with our partners at Fayetteville Cumberland County Parks and Recreation and Market Fair Mall, these stations have been made available across Fayetteville. Each station can charge two cars at once and are available seven days a week. Free charging stations are located at Market Fair Mall, Clark Park, Honeycutt Park, and Lake Rim Park. For more information on PwC and our free charging stations, please visit our website at fayypwc.com. Greetings, I'm Lamont Henson and welcome to another edition of The Facts. Today, we'll be talking about cold weather water situations and trying to answer questions that are commonly asked. So let's start. How does cold weather contribute to water main breaks? Well, everything is typically more brittle the colder it is. And the ground surrounding the main is colder, the water inside the main is also colder. So water main breaks typically occur in older cast iron mains. Cast irons are very rigid and brittle pipe material even in the best of conditions. Water is always moving in the system and spikes in pressure occur whenever there is a flow that has suddenly started or stopped in the pipe. The pressure is usually short lived and still can burst a cold cast iron main even if there are warmer conditions. Moving on to another topic, how to handle water usage if there's a boil water advisory. Now, if there's a boil water advisory going on, of course, we want you to boil that water for any water that's going to be used for human consumption. However, some people are wondering, can I still wash dishes? Can I still take a shower or a bath? Well, let's break that down. Washing your dishes. Well, if you're going to wash your dishes by hand, I don't know if I would advise that you use the water that's coming out of the system immediately. What you might want to do is go ahead and boil the water, allow it to cool, and then wash your dishes using some type of detergent or bleach. If you're going to decide to use a dishwasher, you're probably going to want to use a commercial dishwasher because home dishwashers typically don't reach the temperature needed in order to really get rid of the bacteria, which is about 170 degrees Fahrenheit. One of the commonly asked questions is, what do I do during a boil water advisor if I want to take a shower and or bath? 
if you want to take a shower in the bath and you're a healthy individual, you may want to go ahead and do that. It should be no harm caused. However, if you're a uh, situ if you're in a situation where you're suffering from some type of ailment or you have open sores or wounds, to be on the safe side, you may also want to boil that water, allow it to cool before you use it, and whatever you do, you want to make sure you don't ingest the water in any way. If you're in a cold weather situation and there's a low system pressure that occurs, should you still allow your faucet to drip so that the pipes don't freeze over? Great question. Taking a shower or a bath wouldn't be recommended because you want to allow that water to build back up in the system. However, it is negotiable to allow the faucet to drip just a little bit so that your pipes don't freeze over. During their boil water advisory, how should pet owners respond as far as treatment for water for their pets? Well. Uh, typically, if you want to be on the safe side, there's nothing wrong with boiling their water and allowing it to cool before you serve it to your pet. However, animals typically drink pretty bad water as it is, but it's a case-by-case -case situation depending on the pet. You may want to consult with a veterinarian to get your best advice. Here's a commonly asked question. Why is my water milky or cloudy looking? Well, those are tiny little air bubbles in your water and they're trying to get to the top. It's almost similar to a carbonated beverage uh, like a soda. That air is trying to get to the top and once it's done, it'll be gone and your water should clear out. This is more typical during cold weather. These have been some of the questions that we've had to tackle during cold weather water situations. Hopefully this has been helpful to you. Either way, these have been the facts. You need more information, don't forget to visit our website or check us out on some of our social media platforms. Thanks for tuning in. You're going to have um, smaller black plastic boxes in certain neighborhoods, older neighborhoods will have the metal boxes and that will be your water meters. Uh, further up in the yard, you'll have a greener box that's more, more a private where you have your water sprinklers or any other water systems in your yard. Um, easement from the edge of the road, a, you can get the information from the main city of what is the actual easement from the middle of the road into the yard is where you'll find your transformer box for power, you'll have your telephone box, and you'll have your um, Time Warner box. And those school range in different different sizes. And now, also depending if it's an older neighborhood, you'll have them in metal. In a newer neighborhood, being in plastic. The telephone will always be slender, tall, and almost have like multiple screws sticking out of it. That's usually for the phone company to come out and open them up differently. The Time Warner ones will look like a small bullet, a upside down bullet, a little small mushroom and those are a closed round lid where they're able to pull up and almost act like a chair and then our transformers are range between if it's a pull box it'll be a square on the, on the ground it looks like concrete but it's fiberglass uh, have four screws and uh, those are usually just a where the primary comes through there it's a pull box it's an emergency so it could change out into a transformer and then the actual transformer would be in metal and being open in the front side well, you got your flat ones out there, uh, supposedly they're rated, traffic rated, but your smaller plastic like um, Time Warner or water meters, they are only rated to just, just like say a riding tractor, but any vehicle passing them over in a, in a certain side will break them. So um, on your metal ones or your fiberglass ones, they are, they're rated to a certain depth, but you keep driving over them with something heavier, you will crack them. The transformers, the control box for the whole neighborhood. Most of all your metal transformers will have warnings on them. You don't want to have, it's very important that nobody, no kids, nobody, even though they're nice little boxes you could sit on, that's not a box you want to be sitting on. You want to stay away from it. In summer, when there's a lot of people using air conditioning, them boxes do get hot and, and hot enough where you can't touch them. In the newer neighborhoods, you'll have them above ground. In the older neighborhoods, they'll have a round lid and they're slanted. And we have actual transformer inside the ground. Now, 
don't grab no sticks and don't poke in there. Don't, that's, that's gonna be the same thing. Don't play with them. Anytime when you need to, as simple as putting in a plant, putting in a flower, uh, putting in a driveway, anything that you has to, has to disturb the dirt, you would just call on a cell phone, called uh, 811. The law states that anything digging in North Carolina, you have to call 811. You also have to mark the area in white or use pink flags. Both of those could be found at Home Depot or Lowe's. Small little things you could put out there. Now, if you can't get those, you need to tell 811 you're going to be using different, let's see, you're going to mark it in pink. If you mark it, we'll know, or the locators know when they come out that we don't have to mark that whole area. We'll just mark where you're going to put it at. Or if you're going to put in trees, you put circles of where the trees are going to be at. Your time warner will be the small green plastic. Uh, we'll have cable vision on it. Their main control systems for their amplifiers will be in a doghouse, and that's what's the actual name of it. It's a doghouse, and they'll have flaps on the side. The flaps is to release the heat that's coming out of that, that actual transmission line for them. Your telephones will always be in that, that rectangular, upright, skinny little box, and in the, in the older neighborhoods, they get even smaller. It has all your communications all within that small box. Um, in some yards, depending if you have irrigation, you'll have a backflow preventer. You'll have a green box or a white box, or in some cases on the older neighborhoods, a metal box, or a fiberglass box that stays up about two foot high. And that's how it works. Hi, and welcome to Take One. This is our chance to highlight news, upcoming events, and important FYIs from Fayetteville PwC. Trap it, then toss it. Smart food disposal can help protect our environment, our sources of drinking water, and our property. Dumping grease, fats, and oil is not only illegal, but can also cause sewage backups and flooding. Sewage backups can damage personal and public property. Do your part to prevent such accidents by following these guidelines for proper food disposal. Trap your grease, fat, and oil, then toss it in the garbage. Don't dump cooking oil, poultry fat, and grease into the kitchen sink or the toilet bowl. And don't depend on heavy-duty drain cleaners to fix a grease clog because these cleaners don't melt the grease. It just re-solidifies inside sewer lines and causes blockages. Do dispose of fats, grease, and oils properly by pouring cooled fat, grease, and used cooking oil in a disposable container and putting it in the garbage. You can pick up a free fat trapper, a reusable plastic container with foil bags, to collect grease anytime at the PwC Customer Service Center located at 955 Old Wilmington Road. And remember to use a paper towel to wipe leftover grease or oil off of dishes, pots, and pans prior to washing them. We're counting down the days to the Fayetteville Home Design and Remodeling Show. This can't miss event is set for February 16th through the 18th at the Crown Expo Center. Come see us for tips on how to lower your water and energy consumption. Plus, speak with conservation experts about ways to save at home and take home useful conservation items like LED bulbs and fat trappers. Take a look at this month's customer newsletter enclosed in your bill or visit our website for a coupon to get $2 off the price of admission. And make sure you mark your calendars for the upcoming Power and Water Conservation Expo on Friday, March 23rd and Saturday, March 24th at Skyview on Hay in downtown Fayetteville. The expo is free and open to the public. Just like the home show, we hope you'll come on out and learn ways to save on your energy and water bill and fill up your complimentary reusable tote with handy conservation items and tree seedlings. Thanks for watching Take One. Remember to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel.